So uh, give us your full name. Wayne Wright Woolard. And um, give us your birth date. January 18th, 1954. So where were you born? I was born in Washington, raised in Bath. Okay. And um, where'd you go to school at? Went to high school, graduated from Washington High School in Washington, and graduated from East Carolina University. So what year was your ECU graduation? 1978. So what happened then? What, what were you interested in growing up? What, uh, you, uh, you liked the water. Well, I liked the water. I was very involved in sports, um, especially water skiing and uh, boating. Um, when I graduated from East Carolina, I went to ski for SeaWorld in Orlando and uh, was in the tree business then. i uh, been very interested in trees and how they work. Let's go back and talk about your skiing. What, when did you first start water skiing? I learned to ski when I was in the seventh grade I never skied again until I was a junior in high school, but after then I just kind of took, I took to it and kind of ran with it. So your athletic abilities worked out pretty well when you got into the water. Oh yes. So when you started skiing, what, what interested you about that? How did you get somebody with a boat to pull you? How did you get all that together? Anybody that had a boat fast enough to pull water skis, I would ski behind it. And I mean, literally that, it was like that for many years. And not only did you ski with skis, you skied barefoot. I, I got interested in barefoot skiing. It was in its infancy, and uh, it was something that a lot of people could not do. Uh, it was something that uh, it took a lot of determination to do, and I was a very determined person. So that led you to some professional skiing. You mentioned when you got out of uh, East Carolina University, uh, you went to Florida. Tell, talk us a little bit about that experience and what you did. Well, I had been skiing every year in the barefoot ski tournaments at Cypress Gardens. And a good friend of mine, John Gillette, called me, which I had met skiing in the tournaments at Cypress Gardens and said, won't you come down and ski at SeaWorld for a little while? So that's why I went to SeaWorld and ski. That was in Orlando. So SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida. Pretty high level of skills to be able to work down there. Well, you had to be able to jump, trick, front barefoot, back barefoot. You just basically had to go down and have a good time but know what you were doing. And um, you could even ski barefoot on one foot and turn around is my understanding. Is that... Well, it was just part of uh, the bag that was in a bag of tricks that you had, you know, front barefoot, back barefoot, one foot, toe hold, anything. We were determined that anything you could do on a ski, we were going to do it barefooted. So when did you first meet or get to know Reggie Fountain? I met Reggie when I was nine years old. I had ridden my bicycle down to Haven's Gardens and he brought one of his race boats down. And that's when I first met him. And I could always tell when he had come to Pamico River because I could hear him all the way to my house on Highway 264. And every time I'd hear him, I'd go down and that's when our relationship started. Right here in Washington. Right here in Washington. And what was your first experience? Reggie also water skied. Did you guys water ski together? Uh, about when, when he started making boats here after he went through the Formula One series, uh, we skied. We skied every day. Um, and that's when Whiting was designing the deck of the Executioner. So you never worked for Fountain Power Votes, but you were a very integral part of their team. What did you do? Well, when when we tested boats, when Reggie and I tested boats, I tested a lot of boats with Reggie. One of the things that we did is we could learn how the hydrodynamics on a water ski, skiing on it, we, we could learn what it did. So I could change the bottom of a ski, we could ski on it, and then we could change the bottom of the boat. And getting the hydrodynamics more like aerodynamics, which is like flying, uh, that was our goal. You're also a uh, seasoned pilot. I, I like flying. 
So those two seem very related, particularly with boats. For people that may not be interested, how would you describe hydrodynamics to someone watching? Well, hydrodynamics would be friction in and across the water. And it would be like if you were in a boat and you stuck your hand out on the side of the boat and put five fingers down and felt the force and then went four, three, two, one finger. And the less drag that it takes, the faster you can go. Same thing with aerodynamics, which is in the air. The less drag that you have, the faster you can go. Everybody knows that air is thinner than water, so the more aerodynamic you can be, the better. So you, um, you were attracted to Reggie because you heard his, the engines loudly uh, along the Pamlico and you'd go to Haven Gardens and hook up. When did you and Reggie really get together to do some serious work on boat manufacturing or designing or improving boats? When he started building bi boats there at the old Lee Chevrolet building. Back so you were there from day one? 1980. Oh I was around then. I didn't spend a lot of time right there in the building because that was done in the daytime, but I would come by at night and, uh, and then we, of course we'd ski in the daytime. So you said that was about 1980. 80. So what happened after Old Blue and when did you kind of jump into things and really get more involved? Well, I was involved then um, because Reggie and I skied every day. And when I say every day, if, if we took a boat to test it and went to Moorhead City, we, we skied on the way down and skied on the way back. And if I'd changed a ski or something, then we would evaluate it at that time. And a lot of things that you learned skiing and that Reggie learned on skiing were really helpful to you in being able to fine tune boats. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, again, the hydrodynamics. Um, let, let's take propellers. Uh, the faster a propeller goes through the water, the more efficient it becomes because the water becomes harder. And uh, the, the more the boat can be out of the water and not in the water, you have less drag which enables you to go faster. But there's a balance there. You, even though you're going faster, you still have to be stable and you still have to be able to turn. So you have to find the center of gravity for a happy medium to make the boat balanced like it needs to be. You know Reggie Fountain probably as well personally and professionally as anybody. Talk to us about Reggie Fountain and why he was successful in building fountain power boats? I would have to say innovation and perfection to its limit. Um, uh, Reggie Fountain is, was driven like no other human being I'd ever met in my life. Um, again, he was a perfectionist. Um, he demanded perfection and would only accept perfection. And it didn't make any difference if it was the corner of the back edge of the boat, if it was a button on the upholstery, it had to be 100% right before he would put his name on the side of the boat. You also have some interesting stories about Reggie. You know, he, uh, he dressed up when he went to work. He wore three-piece suits. Reggie wore a three-piece suit every day to work. And when he would leave the office and we would go out to eat and come back, he would get under the boat with a three-piece suit with a grinder to show them how to change the boat. This is how I want it. He would come out, he would come out from under the boat with white gel coat all over his suit. And it was like that day after day. That's how he was so perfect. You know, making uh, a great boat is part of the equation, but the other part of the equation is selling boats. I think an interesting fact about fountain power boats is, is that 23% of every person 
of the whole group that buys a fountain power boat, 23% of the people that buy the boat have never purchased a boat before. With a boat this expensive and of this caliber, why or how is that possible? It's because of the per perfection that Reggie put in the boat. The boat sold itself. Uh, yes, 23% first time boat buyers. Why? The boat sold itself. You could literally put your little finger in the steering wheel, turn the steering wheel. It backed in better when you backed in the slip. It, it accelerated better. It turned better in all aspects of any other boat in the industry. And basically the boat just sold itself. People get in it. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe how it rode. They couldn't how, believe how it handles. Not only going fast, but going slow around the dock. It was just the perfect 10. It was the perfect boat. So, Reggie's a pretty good salesman, too. He had a stellar career in the life insurance industry before he started Fountain Power Boats. And um, some of those lessons he brought with him. What typically would happen when someone would come to town wanting to buy a fountain power boat? What happened? You were involved in a lot of that. In the beginning, every boat that was sold basically meant whether the, whether the company was going to make it or break it. They'd come to fountain power boats. They would stay at Reggie's house. They would see the boat during the day. In the afternoons, we'd get in my ski boat, Reggie and I would take the customer up the Tar River. We would take them skiing. A lot of them would ski with us. Then we would take them out to eat. Then they'd go back to Reggie's house, spend the night. When they would send a letter back, they would all say, we've never been treated this way. It's the best hospitality any human being could ever want. They so, were so where'd you take them to eat? Most of the time, Cliff Seafood. In Chocowinity. In Chocowinity. Great food. And uh, missed that place a lot. Uh, you also, um, because you were a pilot, uh, Reggie had a pilot, but you were always there and uh, capable of a lot of different things. You, you went to a lot of the boat shows, too. Tell us about some of that. I went to every Miami boat show since Whiting and I went down the first time. And, and when Whiting and I went down the first time, what amazed me about being the first to do this, that, and the other, when we stopped and, stopped and bought the carpet and the plants and this, that, and the other, it didn't take us long to set it up because he knew, he said, put this here, 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 and here. He had it in his mind what it was going to look like. And we actually won the best booth in the whole Miami Boat Show, which was the largest boat show in the world the first year we were there, and it was because of Whiting's forethought. Wow. Talk to us about uh, some of the people that own Fountain Power Boats. Who are, who are some of the people that, names people would recognize or other characters that uh, own a Fountain Power Boat? Well, President Bush and his son, uh, they've had three Fountain Power Boats. Uh, of course, you've got President Saharto of Indonesia, uh, King Hussein of Jordan was a good customer. And, of course, we had uh, John Gotti had, had bought fountains, uh, John Salupi, John Rosati. Um, a lot of the, every time you won a race at Charlotte, whichever NASCAR driver won the race, won a fountain powerboat. Um, a lot of dignitaries, a lot of movie stars, Rusty Wallace, um, just the list goes on and on and on. A lot of CEOs of companies, uh, a lot of innovators. Um, when I say innovators, people that have uh, designed something and patented it because they could really appreciate what the fountain boat offered that other boat companies did not. What's uh, your view of how Fountain Power Boats and Reggie Fountain impacted Beaufort County and Washington? Well, one of my favorite sayings is that Reggie Fountain and Jim Hackney have done more for Beaufort County than any two individuals in the history of this county. 
And how do you view Reggie as far as all the people out there that were interested in developing, manufacturing, and selling some type of a speedboat? I'm sorry, say that again? How do you, how do you view Reggie in the world of people that are developing and, and running speedboats? How does he stack up? Reggie Fountain was so far ahead of anybody in the boating industry. I mean, on a scale of one to 10, with everybody else being uh, a one, he was a 25. Uh, it, it just took uh, some innovation that was in his mind to produce the product. And it just took the whole world by storm. Anybody who is anybody knows Fountain Power Boats because of Reggie's innovation. What's your favorite uh, Reggie Fountain story? Gee, uh, let's you see. Tell us. Oh, yeah, I was getting ready to say the statute of limitations hadn't run out on them. Let me see. Uh, my favorite story uh, was how people became to call Reggie, uh, instead of calling it a fountain, a fountain. Um, we were in uh, Fort Lauderdale, and we just pulled up in John Rosati's 33-foot fountain, which he had just run through a 30-foot wave, which was when we just found out that the functional bow worked. And we, put, we didn't have cell phones, and we pulled the boat up beside the dock, and there just happened to be a phone booth there, and Reggie's on the phone. All the boats are rafted up, and this man comes up in this cold, smut black, well-craft scarab, making all this noise. He starts walking across the boats, and he throws his hands up, and he says, I'll run anybody out here for a thousand dollars. So he wants to race. He wanted to race. I'll run anybody. And he's going up to the different tables and this, that, and the other, getting in people's faces. You got a boat you want to run? And I'm just sitting there by myself waiting for Reggie to get off the phone. John Rosati comes up behind me and he says, Wayne, you tell that uh, fella um, that you won't race anybody for $1,000, but you'll race him for $10,000. And anyway, he sticks this wad in my pocket. So I'm just sitting there and he finally, he comes around and he's so annoying. I just knew that the staff was going to throw him out. But uh, he comes up to me and he, he's towering over me. He says, you got anything you want to run? I'll run anything. And I said, he said, for $1,000. I said, well, I won't run you for $1,000 because I don't run anybody for less than $10,000. Well, the whole place got quiet. I mean, the, everybody in the restaurant got quiet. He said, what are you going to run? I said, you said it didn't matter. He said, well, what you going to run? I said, I'm going to run a fountain. He threw his hands up and he said, I don't run no fountain. He said, that Reggie Fountain builds the fastest boat in the world. Then the staff came over and literally threw him out. But that's how Reggie got the name uh, Mr. Fountain. Great story. It was from him. Great story. Tell us uh, maybe a favorite story, uh, something that happened to you at the Miami Boat Show, one of the most prestigious boat shows in the world. And... Gosh, you were hanging around and helping, and a lot of times there were long lines to be able to come to the fountain booth. Oh, there was always long lines because uh, I had the outside docks, which is the boats that were in the water at the Biscayne Bay Marriott, and inside sails were at the convention center, and um, which the original show that we had was big enough to put two boats in, and then we ended up with up the biggest place in the whole building, which was like big enough to put five or six boats in. Um, but yeah, there was plenty of lines and uh, a, you know, a lot going on. Um, we had one situation where Mercury Marine had come out with the new EFI, electronic fuel injected, 415 horsepower engines. And uh, all the sport boat manufacturers had them that year, which is always in February. And, but what happened was, is that when you started them up and got them warmed up, they wouldn't idle in and out and we couldn't keep them started. Well, uh, this was happening to us and everybody else. So after we went out one time and came back in, I went up to the ship store and bought like five bags of wooden clothespins. <laughs> 
And I took those wooden clothespins and I put them on the fuel rails of the three sport boats that we had there. And we were running in and out, in and out, but we were the only sport boats that were running. Uh, none of the other boats could run because they were vapor locking. Well, three engineers came down from Mercury and they said, you having any trouble with the engines? And I said, well, not now. And they said, well, what, what did you do? I said, well, one thing, I'm running the blowers all the time. I keep the hatch cracked to get more air. And uh, I opened up the hatch covers and he looks down at the engine and it looks like two porcupines sitting back there with all the clothespins on it. And he said, he, he got all up in the air and said, what are you doing? You can't show people this, that, and the other. And that got wooden clothespins on the boat. And I said, yes, I can. All you got to do is go buy some clothespins and you can do it. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, he got all irate and said, well, I'm going to call Reggie. And I said, well, hold on a second. I'll give you his phone number. I said, and when you're talking to him, see if you can get him to fire me. You know, uh, so I see him over talking to Reggie on the phone and uh, he's got his arms all up in the air and and uh, he doesn't come back. But the two younger guys with him, they waved and kind of smiled and they went on. Well, I'm getting ready to do my next ride and my phone rings and Reggie's called me and he says, Wayne, I don't know what you're doing over there, but keep doing it. <laughs> he said, we've sold 146 boats oh already wow. and nobody else was selling them because of those clothespins. Wow. Well, that's a wild story. What else would you like to tell us about Reggie Fountain? Well, basically, I would like to thank Reggie on behalf of everybody in Beaufort County and everybody in the world that's a true boater, um, a fisherman, because we know we haven't mentioned fish boats, um, because Reggie Fountain is the true king of offshore. He is the admiral of all innovators. Um, you, I just couldn't say enough about what Reggie Fountain has done. And he's one of the most kind-hearted people that you'll ever meet or ever know, and still is to this day. He would give you the shirt off his back if he didn't know you. What else would you like to tell us today? Oh, geez. I want you to tell us the story about hang gliding around the Statue of Liberty. Okay, I can tell you about hang gliding around the Statue of Liberty. Um, in 1986, uh, nobody had um, ever flown a hang glider over the Statue of Liberty. They had one guy that went up on the first deck there, put the hang glider together and jumped off and got arrested. So um, Gene Sayre and I, who was with, he was with the Colonial Ski Club, and we had the Tar Heel Footers here, which we did our shows barefooted, and we'd go up and do uh, the barefooting for them. And we would take turns flying the hang glider, and Gene and I were talking one day, we said, you know, I want to, I want to fly around the Statue of Liberty. Nobody's ever done that. So we decided we were going to do that. So I called John Rosati, um, who was before John Gotti, and said, John, I want to come up and fly my hang glider around the Statue of Liberty, but I don't want, and I'm not going to do anything illegal, but I don't want to run into the cause I said so law. And in other words, um, when the policeman comes up to you with the badge and the gun and says, you can't do that. And I say, why? Because I said so. John said, no problem. He said, I'll pull one of my boats out of uh, my, one of my hangers, one of my jets out of the hangar, and you can put your boat in there. He said, but we're building Port Liberté. And you can have the whole mile and a half shoreline. So we go up, we tow up from there. Um, of course, we're skiing in the Hudson, which no one had ever done, never seen anybody ski. And uh, one thing I remember is one of those big ferries is going along and everybody runs to one side of the ferry and you can see the port propeller top of it coming out of the water. <laughs> and you can hear the captain on the bullhorn saying, go back to the other side because they're over here watching us. But, the, but we, I, I flew over to Statue of Liberty three times and um, we water skied, spent two or three days up there. And every law enforcement 
which, which you have the New Jersey side and the New York side that came by us, not one person ever looked at us. When everybody else was trying to get around us, they never looked at us. Thank you, John Rosati. Um, but uh, it was fun. I took a video camera and a steel camera, and Gene and I got some great shots. So what do you think uh, the most impressive thing besides hang gliding around the Statue of Liberty that you've done that you'd like to tell us about? You've done a lot of things. You were invited one time to be in a ski show for King, King Hussein. Hussein. Uh, tell us about that a little bit. Well, my good buddy John Gillette called me and said, Wayne said, uh, um, King, Queen Noor has... Uh, we're going to do us a prize birthday party for King Hussein. Going to close the Suez Canal, and we can take like ten skiers over there. And um, we want you to come. I said, "Great. When is it?" And he told me, and I said, "Can't go. That is the one day out of the year that I take my grandmother to her sisters in Moorhead City, and uh, that's her day." But long story short, they they ended up they went over. Got to the airport early, and uh, John was telling me about it when they got back. Um, number one, uh, they, they had the grandstand set up on the side of the Suez Canal, and so everybody could come and see. Uh, but, of course, you have these swells when these boats slow down. It's called a bow wave, and it just rolls in there. But they got to the airport early, and um, they were met by the customs people before King Hussein's people got there and they had their skis and everything and they put them in a room and they were looking at Sammy Duvall's jumpers and one of them and Sammy came over and showed him a picture on the front of Water Ski Magazine of him having the skis on jumping in the air and one of them even put one up to his shoulder well when he showed them that everybody came to attention you know got their guns ready and whatever because this guy's got rockets on his feet mm -hmm. So then King Hussein's men came in and of course everybody came to attention, wouldn't look him in the face and whatever. And he came over, spoke very fluent English and apologized and they went and did the ski show. Um, the other time, another good story is up in Edgewater, Maryland, there was a ski school there right at the foot of the bridge and a fellow named Al Partine had a ski school there. And Steve Hendricks and I went up. We were dating a couple of girls from the Washington School of Ballet. Uh, believe it or not, from Little Washington, dating ballet girls from Washington, D.C. Who would have thought? But anyway, um, uh, Al, uh, I went over and went skiing with Al Partine, and he told me, he said, um, asked me would I come back and uh, teach two special clients how to barefoot water ski. And I said, sure, just let me know. And he called me up and he told me when it was. He said, it's the last weekend they can do it. And, and he told me when it was. And I said, I can't do it. This was the next year. And this was my grandmother's day with her sister. Um, but what he told me was, he says, I, I can't tell you who, it was, who, who they are at that particular time. But he said, they're filming some movie about presidents, um, uh, anyway, it was uh, Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford, and they were filming All the President's Men. That's the movie they were working on, and this was their last day. And they had been coming right regularly over there to ski with them. And they wanted to te have you teach them how to ski? They wanted to learn how to barefoot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and anyway, I had some techniques that could teach. I mean, I could take anybody in here out and put them on a boom right now and teach you how to barefoot water ski. Uh, but anyway, that's what he wanted me to do. You and Reggie um, have something in common that I think is interesting. Um, Reggie Fountain has never smoked a cigarette or a cigar or any kind of tobacco, and he's never had a, any kind of drink of alcohol. Um, you have those same features. How come? I've never smoked a cigarette or tasted alcohol now, I've chewed some chewing tobacco, but, <laughs> but I've never smoked a cigarette or tasted alcohol because the first thing that I can ever remember remembering as a child, my grandmother, we would go in when we would go to bed at night. We'd get out on our hands and knees by the bed, and we would say our prayers. 
And my grandmother would say, now, Wayne, if, there, if you don't ever do anything for me as long as you live, never smoke or drink. And I told her that's what I would do, and that's why I never have. Don't have nothing against it, but that's why I never have. My gosh. Well, uh, going around all these boat shows and things, you certainly had a lot of opportunities. You also had your, when you were going to East Carolina University, uh, some of your friends um, thought maybe they could convince you otherwise. What, what happened? Well, just before we graduated, a bunch of, I was always the driver <laughs> uh, and um, kind of always kept people from, kept the group from stepping over the line and getting locked up or whatever. And there was a restaurant there called Lums. And um, we we're all sitting around the table and it was, everybody was graduating and going to different ways and whatever. And they put $500 on the table. Now, what five, year would this been? 1977 or 78. They put $500 on the table to take one swallow out of a beer. And I said, can you do it? And honestly, it wouldn't have made any difference if it was $500 million. It wouldn't have made a bit of difference to me then, just like it does it now. Interesting. What else would you like to tell us today? Oh, Jesus. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. <laughs> Glad to be here. Um, I don't know. What, what do you want to hear? <laughs> well, I, I, I think you've shared a lot of things and want to appreciate you talking to us and giving us some insight into Reggie Fountain. My pleasure. <laughs>